When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known that in this thy day the things that are for thy peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. In the fog and the sun of the dust. Amen. My dear faithful, it is always profitable and worth our time to look over, explain, try to draw our lessons from our Lord in the gospel of the day. What does our Lord do? What does he say? What does he not do? And it is no it is is no different here. We have this this interesting episode. It's for the end of the life of our Lord. It's not long away before his passion. And we see our Lord showing forth sadness and anger. Sadness and anger. Our Lord shows us these two emotions in his actions in today's gospel. Weeping over Jerusalem and uh, casting out with his anger, those who are profaning the temple in Jerusalem. So let's look today a little bit at these two emotions that our Lord shows us to see how we should imitate our Lord and maybe correct those situations where we are not following our Lord's example. Firstly, our Lord weeps over Jerusalem. If you remember in the gospel, he is returning from Jericho to Jerusalem. He's on that road and as it comes over a certain point, is right around Palm Sunday, he stops on the road, a sort of a, what we would call a scenic over, overlook, sort of a point in the road where it's sort of an elevation, and he can see the whole city of Jerusalem, the beautiful temple, the city of peace. It should be his city. But the day of crucifixion is not far away. The day where he is betrayed, the day where he is, in fact, murdered, and he begins to weep over the city of Jerusalem. So let's look at this firstly. Our Lord Jesus Christ is crying. Why does he cry? He's not crying a sign of weakness. If he is God and man and the perfect man and, of course, perfect God, how could he show this weakness? You know there is, there are, well, you, you should know there are two, let's say, extremes Two errors when it comes to crying or weeping or, let's say, emotion. There is the ancient Stoics, let's say the pagan Stoics, who thought that an adult man should never show his feelings. He should never cry, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what terrible thing or sad thing is happening. He should never show anger or sadness. He should be completely without emotion. They sort of denied the very uh, reality of our human nature that we are given emotions by God. So they went to one extreme of saying zero emotion. Even if you're feeling something inside, there's some emotion, it must be suppressed. It must be crushed. It must be controlled to such a point that no one else knows your emotions. That's the error of the, let's say, stoicism. And of course, there's another error on the other side of extreme emotion. Too much, we will see. But our Lord Jesus Christ is a human being. He's truly man, as well as being truly God. And therefore, he has both joy and sorrows. He was, he was truly man in reality. He had the feelings of every other human being. And therefore, he can show his emotion, his sorrow, his joy, etc., his anger, as we will see. It is not wrong, therefore, we can see by our Lord, there are times, there are moments in our lives where tears are completely natural and good. That we weep over something that is painful. You, you injure yourself with some great injury and it causes tears. That's because of the pain. Or a, a very close loved one, maybe the most loved person you have on this earth, they, they die tragically. 
There is a, a natural sorrow to that is a, is, is a good and, 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 and actually very healthy thing to weep over that loss. Of course, there are, there are limits to that, of course. You cannot spend your, your whole life doing that. But there is a time for it, as we read in, in the Old Testament. So there is a there is a good balance of when we cry and when we are sad and what we are sad for. Some people become sad and they weep because they cannot get what they want. They are disappointed in others. They think that they will find happiness in someone else or in a physical object. And that thing is taken away from them and they get very uh, saddened and they cry. You see sometimes children do this. They want something in the store. We often see this in the in the supermarkets, they want some candy or some other thing, and the parents say, no, 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 not for you. And they start crying, and they get very sad. They're using that sadness in the wrong way. They're becoming sad for the wrong reasons, and they're just trying to manipulate sometimes their parents. They're hoping the parents will see the tears and give them what they want. Or sometimes adults do this as well, men and women. There is an extreme of Emotion on the other way, where people use emotion too much. And they're, they become a slave to their emotions. Every feeling they have must be held on to and must be exaggerated and used. Of course, that's the opposite of the Stoics, who are trying to crush and, and withhold all emotion. There are those who lose control and their emotions, uh, let's say, control them. There are two extremes there. Or people become saddened and they weep over things that are not so important. We will see that we speak about anger. But our Lord here is very interesting. He gives us the beautiful uh, mean, the beautiful uh, rule to follow. He weeps over something important. And interestingly, our Lord does not weep over the suffering that's going to come to him. Our Lord is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He sees from the very moment he was conceived. He sees from all eternity even the, the, the suffering and the cross, the passion that's coming to him. And even worse, the betrayal of those who would know of his suffering would still want to sin. Our Lord had reason to weep over that, over all of the, the pains and sufferings that were going to come to him. But he does not. He says, no, 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 I'm not here to shed tears. I'm here to shed my precious blood for mankind. I don't want to shed tears for myself. I want to shed them for others. And he weeps over Jerusalem because they are uh, favored. They are given so many graces, so many gifts. They're giving his very presence on the earth, and they reject him. This is why he says to uh, in the station of the cross, the women of Jerusalem weep over Jesus. And he says, do not weep for me, but for yourselves and for your children. Our Lord is giving us that rule. We should weep over the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Weep over the impenitence, the ingratitude of those who reject our Lord. Our Lord has spent so much time and effort, all the miracles all the wonderful teachings, everything our Lord did for the salvation of our souls, and we still reject him. That's reason for weeping. That's what our Lord shows us. He's weeping over Jerusalem because they reject the, 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 the salvation of their souls. He weeps over the, the loss of the souls of so many of the Jews because of their stubbornness, because of their pride, they didn't. They they lost their their country. They will lose their city soon, and they will more importantly lose their souls. The Our Lord says this is a reason for weeping. This is something that we we learn. We should learn. We, there was there is a priority of tears. There is a reason for tears. Yes, you know when your when your your pet uh, parakeet dies. Okay, a little bit sad, but not so big deal. Your very much loved dog or cat that you spent many years with, it dies, okay, it's a little bit sad, fine. Someone loved in your family, so a very close relative dies, yeah, that's a reason for tears. Another higher priority, my own sins, my own weaknesses, my own defects that I have offended God. These are the highest reason for tears. 
You see that with um, St. Mary Magdalene. You see that with St. Peter. When they recognize what they have done, they cannot stop weeping. They understood sin. This is something we, we need to examine ourselves. Or even more so, I would say, not just our own sins, of course, but that sins are committed against God. Sins of of so many uh, of people on, the, in this, on this earth, or even more, the loss of souls. That's a reason for sadness. That's a reason for sadness to say how many thousands, millions, billions, I don't know, souls die on this earth. They die without the grace to save their souls, without the faith. They've rejected it or it's never been brought to them perhaps. But they die and they are not able to get into heaven. The loss of so many souls. That's a reason for sadness. That's a reason for, 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 for tears. Or the, the sufferings and the persecutions of Holy Mother of the Church in so many places. These are reasons for sadness. These are real reasons for sadness. There's something wrong with us. And we can admit it. We can say that you know we're not perfect. If we are not saddened by the loss of souls all around the world, or the scandals which cause the loss of souls. There's something wrong. We do not have charity. Charity is the love of God and the love of our neighbor. When you love your neighbor, when you wish the good of your neighbor, you want them to save their souls. There is something in balance, and we, we come across this quite often. Where, Father, did you hear this latest scandal, this horrible thing that's happening? Do you hear about this sinful thing? And there's almost like a little bit of glee, like, it's so interesting, it's so exciting. And I'm like, we should be crying for those things. We should be weeping. We should not be willing, our first instinct should not be to run out and let everybody know of this latest horrible thing. It should be, actually, this is sad. This is an offense against God. This is a rejection of God. This is a reason for sadness. Our Lord shows us that sadness has a place. Sorrow has a place. Tears have a place. If, if, we, if we had a well-balanced soul, if we were, you know, the, the closer we come to our Lord, the more we are able to cry properly. You know, obviously, uh, we should have to have a... Uh, a shower tiled floor in the confessional. If everything was going well, people would always be crying in the confessional, a priest included. We would all be crying because sin is the, the highest thing. The most important reason to cry is, is sin. We need to have some sort of drainage floor in the confessional. It would be if everything was going well. If we were, everyone was doing their job properly and things were going well, that would be the reason for tears. It would be called the room of tears, the box of tears. That would make sense. That's, that's the goal. The goal is that everyone comes out with red eyes. That would be wonderful. But it's just a reminder to us. Our Lord shows us that tears are a good thing. Used properly, done properly, sadness, all these are good things. These are good things. That's why our Lord shows us this. And then, of course, you go almost to the, it seems like the other extreme. Our Lord talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he goes down in Jerusalem. He goes into the temple. And he clears the buyers and the sellers, the animals, the people, the money changers. He clears them all out. We see in another part of the gospel, a, a second time he had done it earlier, where he used a whip and he drove them out with physically harming them. Yes, our Lord beat people. That's quite shocking because we, it's not what we think of when we think of our Lord. He enters in the temple, begins to cast out them that sold therein. You know, you've heard there are many explanations of this, that it is, it is sort of the, the vestibule, we would say, or let's say maybe the bookstore. There's the outside the church. Uh, they, people come to, they need to buy an animal, an ox, a, a dove, a sheep. They need to buy something to have the priest offer for sacrifice when they come from far away. They can't bring the animal with them. So they come outside the temple and they buy it and they give it over to the priest. The priest goes sacrifice it. But they can't use, maybe they've got Roman money, they've got different currencies. They need to also change their money. So they need to buy, and there needs to be buying and selling near the temple. There needs to be money changing in nearby to make it all convenient. But over the years, through problematic, uh, through laziness maybe, through convenience, they started to come in to the court of the Gentiles. They started to come inside the precincts of the temple. And, that's one problem, 
And the second problem was there was some cheating going on. There's some stealing. There was some, uh, let's say, not honest uh, buyers and sellers. The sellers were maybe cheating people or changing the currency rates un un unjustly or, or charging too much for the animals or whatever it was. There was some thievery going on. There's two problems. There's, there's this marketplace that's coming inside the temple and even more so, there's some unjust injustice going on as well. So this makes our Lord very angry. A profanation of the temple. His holy anger is shown forth and he casts them out. I mean, imagine the equivalent of this, of trying to go into some super, you try to go walk across the street at Thompson Plaza and just with an angry face, with loud words, you drive all the buyers and sellers, you drive the people and the buyers and sellers out of the, uh, the plaza. You kick everyone out. Imagine how hard that would be. But this is the just and the holy anger of our Lord that makes it possible. He says, my, it is written, my house is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. Imagine that. Our Lord does this. It's, it's, as I said, it's a little bit shocking because we think of our Lord being so mild and gentle. In many cases, throughout, throughout the life of our Lord, he deals with sinners with such gentleness, with such humility. You see that with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he treats so, so lovely. With the adulteress, and even with Mary Magdalene, he is so gentle with them. A correction, but a correction that is sort of wrapped up in, in cotton wool, a, a correction filled with honey. It's very gentle. And here our Lord, is it as bad as adultery? I don't know. The way our Lord treats it, it's proof that nothing displeases our Lord as much as profanation of a holy place or disrespect of a holy place or, or uh, dishonor or abuse of a holy thing or a holy place. It's very interesting. It, it gives us such a clear picture. And that was the temple. The temple, which was magnificent in its architecture, its structure, the temple had the Ark of the Covenant. That's like nothing compared to the altar of sacrifice of the Mass and the tabernacle and our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. You take the Blessed Sacrament and compare the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is absolutely worthless. It's something holy. There's some holy objects. Yes, of course. Yes. But just objects. This is God himself. So even the most humble, small little chapel or the most beautiful basilica, they are much more valuable than the, the temple in Jerusalem. And our Lord wants us to treat it with great respect. They are holy places. This is why, <clears throat> you know, the priests sometimes will, or at least myself, I don't know about other priests, will yell at people. I will, it's one of the things I will absolutely have no qualms of conscience when I shout at people to be quiet in the church. And it's not, it's in many countries I've done that. And there's this really weird uh, abuse, this weird habit people have with just, they treat the, the sacred place as a place they can chit-chat with their neighbor, where they can look around and, and just do whatever they want. It's even worse, I see many people sending messages on their phone and just messing around, playing video games. I've seen all kinds of horrible things. You see how our Lord treats something for the Jerusalem temple, which is so small compared to his very presence in the Blessed Sacrament. People talking in church. People looking around to see what other people are doing in church. Our Lord treats these things very seriously. This is a place of prayer. This is a place to think of God, to speak to God, to adore God, to thank God. <clears throat> it's not the place for regular human interaction. You don't need to greet. I understand the, the respect. You know, a priest walks to the chapel. Hey, Father, good morning, Father. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. But I'm just saying good morning. It's okay. This is God's place. It's not the place to greet me or greet the priest. It's very lovely you do this. It's a very lovely thing to want to do that. Yeah, I understand. Wait till the priest is outside or in the sacristy or somewhere else. This is the place for God. It's not regular human interaction. It's a different place. That's why there's holy water normally outside the church. You take holy water, you bless yourself going in. 
You're sanctifying yourself because you're going into a holy place. You can also take holy water when you're going out, but the idea is, listen, you're already sanctified, you're sanctified coming into it. It's a different place. This is something that we cannot get through, and that's why what happens in the church and the chapels is so important. That's why we put such emphasis on the true mass, the liturgy, because the things that are done are so much more serious inside the holy place. This is why abuses in liturgy and scandalous performances and uh, pagan pagan things that go on in some churches, it's so much worse than what you think because it's inside the holy place. That's why it's even more serious than sometimes we consider. Oh, just another pagan ceremony, or oh, another dragon dance, or oh, another ancestor worship thing, oh, another this, another that. It's even worse than that because it's in the place which is a place of prayer, the place of worship, the, uh, much more important than what we ever consider. This is why our Lord was so angry, and it was a wonderful anger. Anger is a magnificent tool when used properly. When Again, just like with sadness, there are people who go to both extremes. They don't get angry ever because it's too much work and it's, I don't want to use all that effort to get angry. It's a bit too much work for me and I'll just stay placid. I'll never say anything. And, okay, fine. That's an error. That's wrong. And then there's the other extreme where people get angry for the most silly things. They get angry at, at, the, at the, as we say, at the, at the drop of a hat, at the touch of a button. They're angry. So that's one of my, my hot button issues and I get angry. You know, they're driving on the road. They get really angry at other drivers. But the same people maybe won't be angry at sin, angry at their own sins. They're really angry at everything everybody else has ever done or possibly done or they think they have done. Okay, what about the anger against our own sin, the anger of our own faults? I should be firstly fix these things with my anger. Anger is a tool. It can be very useful. Parents can correctly use anger with their children, use properly with control and say, I am very angry with you. You have disappointed me because you have not obeyed me. You have not done your duty. Okay, that's the anger it can be very useful. And our Lord shows today that there is a, a good use, a good place for anger. But again, just like sadness, it must not, we not, must not become slaves to that anger where we lose control or we get angry and the wrong balance of things, the wrong proportion. We get angry over something very small. Oh, this person made a mistake in the household. They, they didn't do this right, or they broke this glass. They're going to be really angry. Okay, well, no. There's a proportion. There's a balance. There are things, again, higher things that we get angry about. Angry against injustice to God. Angry against the persecution of God's church. Angry about our own sin. Yes. We say that every Sunday night in Compland. Be angry and sin not. Use your anger to, to make a difference where you start changing your life. Be angry at your weakness. Be angry at your bad habit. Be angry at that occasion of sin and, and cut it out ruthlessly with anger. That's the, the proper use our Lord shows us today. My dear faithful, it is an interesting gospel of our Lord's sadness as a wonderful thing. That's that sadness of the sacred heart that wants so much the salvation of our souls that our Lord will shed tears. He will shed his blood for the good of our souls. And at the same time, he will also say, I will not tolerate the misuse of my holy place. I will not misuse the, I will, I will not tolerate the abuse of the sacred place, the place where we are here to speak to God, to listen to God, the place where we're here to adore God, the place where we're here to thank God, so we might follow our Lord's example in his sadness, in his anger, in the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.